but I'm now uh, very happy to introduce our next speaker, Professor Bas Blome. He's a neurologist at the uh, uh, Rabboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands and obtained, and he received his medical degree with honors at Leiden University Medical Center in 1993 and then a PhD in 1994. He then trained as a neurologist and received additional training in movement disorders at the Parkinson's Institute in Sunnyvale, California, and then at the Institute of Neurology in Queen Square, London. In 2008, he was appointed as a professor of neurology uh, with movement disorders as a special area of interest. Um, professor Blome is on the editorial boards of multiple leading national and international scientific journals, and he has a remarkable over 800 publications. At that rate, I think he's going to have a few more by the end of his talk here today. Um, to his, he, since 2020, he serves as the co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Parkinson's Disease. And in 2002, Professor Blome founded the um, Rabudunk, and, and my apologies for the pronunciation there, uh, Center of Expertise for Parkinson's and Movement Disorders. Uh, and then he helped to develop Parkinson's Net, which is an innovative care concept for uh, people with Parkinson's consisting of 70 professional regional networks. He is involved in leadership roles in multiple societies that I, I don't have time to list, but for example, he's on the Executive Scientific Advisory Board of the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. In 2018, he won the Tom Isaacs Award from the Cure Parkinson's in recognition of longstanding achievements in the field of Parkinson's. And in 2022, he received the Stephen Award, which is the highest recognition for a Dutch scientist uh, who has had the greatest impact on society. Um, you know, I could go on. These are just some examples of, of his many honors. And it is our honor today to have him speak to us uh, about exercise in Parkinson's. So thank you, Professor Blome. Thank you, uh, David. That is um, far too much honor um, and far too much time for an introduction. Sure. Well, let me just say that I'm very thankful for the invitation. And, uh, you know, my, my, my passion is to share knowledge and uh, uh, obviously, um, I hope in, in due course we can all meet in person, although at the same time, for those of you who follow my work, this is not the topic of my presentation today, but I'm very concerned about pollution of our environment and how that impacts on the growth of Parkinson's. So in that sense, I'm happy to be in Holland, um, not polluting the environment further with carbon monoxide um, because of flights, um, but that's a little side note. So um, we'll talk about a recipe for action for exercise. Next slide. Uh, it's always good to um, start with a number of disclosures. This is my father, who's alive and kicking. He was a teacher in uh, sports in, in my own high school. He was my own exercise teacher, if you will. So it's in my genes. Uh, it's in my blood. Uh, and I grew up uh, with exercise right from the first moment I could think um, that um, probably materialized through a brief career as a semi-elite professional athlete. Um, uh, this is the Dutch national volleyball team under 18 in 1985, uh, where we beat the Russians for the first time at a major uh, international tournament. Um, if you click three times um, in a row, um, uh, David, you'll see these people all won Olympic gold in Atlanta. Uh, so they went on to the, you know, the grown-ups. And if you click one more time, that's the young Baus Blue um, who took a left turn and decided to become a doctor and a scientist. Um, so this is how life can go. But it definitely convinced me how important exercise is. And volleyball is, I think, an exemplary sport of why you need multidisciplinary uh, collaboration. If you're interested, you, I'm, I'm always happy to chat with you about volleyball. What gives me extreme pride is that this is my oldest son, Jochem, who is now playing for the national B team um, and also um, uh, in the uh, Premier League in the Netherlands. And in the next video, you'll see him in action. He's number two. Uh, so you can see him at the net. This is a crucial game. He's playing champions in the Netherlands. So he's in green. You can see him at this side of the net. The left side. Uh, these are the opponents serving. The set initially goes on the outside and then they fail to score. Look at what's happening here. Boom! 
Okay, you can advance to the next slide, David. That was my uh, son scoring a crucial point. And this is my youngest son. Uh, you can see he has exactly my posture. He's built in exactly the way that I am. So you can see how our entire family lives and breathes exercise. And I always tell my patients, practice what you preach. And my entirely family, again, you know, lives and breathes exercise. Um, I'm just going to take the liberty of taking one little sidestep. Uh, I did not have the privilege of hearing Dr. Frank's presentation. And I just wanted to make one comment because I've published about this. I know that the word honeymoon was once designed with the best intentions. The word honeymoon was designed to reflect the fact that, you know, there was an initially gratifying response to levodopa and a stable response to levodopa, um, which for intercollegiate communication, it was perfect and well to use the word honey. Um, we have argued in a paper that just came out, and this is, I, I thought I have to say something about it. I think now we're living in a time where patients are seeing what we are discussing between us. And I think the word honeymoon served a role in the 70s when we first discovered response fluctuations. It served a major role in the education and the curriculum of young. But I don't think that there is any patient with Parkinson's disease in the world who after the three words, you have Parkinson said, oh, my honeymoon has started. And in fact, I know, and the paper is co-authored by a number of people living with Parkinson's, that some of them are outright insulted by the fact that we professionals use the word honeymoon. So I don't think that any, any patient will tell you that it feels like a honeymoon. They, they feel desperate. You know, their future collapses, their dreams, you know, are gone, and they're full of worries and despair. Maybe the honeymoon is a honeymoon for the doctor, because it's an easy time for us, right? You, you rarely see the patients. I see them like once a year in the early years of Parkinson's. But for the patient, it's not a honeymoon. So I think um, I would argue that it's time to abandon the term honeymoon for Parkinson's. So I just a little sidekick. And I know it's done with all the, you know, it, it served a role, but I think it's time to stop that. This is one of my favorite cartoons. This is a moment in uh, uh, one of the major cycling events in Europe. It's called the Round of Flanders. And the left guy is a Dutchman who beats the other guy on the right by less than the thickness of a tire in this major, major event. This is the highlight of, of the spring. And the fact that that guy on the left wins means his sleep, his nutrition, his food, his materials, the massage, you know, everything needs to be right. And that's that makes the difference for elite athletes. And I think if you've got Parkinson's disease, you have to live the life of an athlete. Everything needs to be right. Yes, it's the medication. Of course, you know, levodopa. But I take a very holistic approach to Parkinson's. Bowel movements, sleep, exercise, as we'll talk about in a minute. Nutrition, which would be a wonderful topic for maybe next year. Stress levels. We have a big program in my team now on stress levels. And we'll zoom in on exercise, but I think living the life of Parkinson's is living the life of an elite athlete, and exercise is a critical component. Um, and it's a lively topic. Uh, I just did this uh, PubMed search, close to 6,000 papers on exercise or physical activity. Next slide. And there are over 130 ongoing trials in this field. So this is a field that is very much alive. Um, and during my last summer holiday, and this is a book that I can highly recommend. Um, it's a book by Bill Hayes. And Bill Hayes um, um, uh, uh, wrote this book about the history of exercise, and it's called Sweat. Um, and it's a brilliant book. And I will illustrate my talk. It's larded with you know, little hints and referrals uh, to this brilliant book. The first thing that Bill Hayes is doing is he goes back to ancient history. And in ancient Greek times and ancient Roman times, exercise was part of culture. Uh, the Olympic Games, you know, not by coincidence, started in Olympia. Um, and in those old days, uh, exercise 
refer to both physical and mental exercise. Uh, initially, it was for training of animals and later for preparing humans for war. Uh, remember the famous Spartan army. And in his book, he nicely separates, um, uh, you know, what is the intention behind movement? Um, if you just go from A to B, that's transportation, uh, not exercise. Uh, if you compete, it's sports. And again, sports is not uh, exercise. Um, and if you want to enhance your beauty, that's vanity. And I thought that was also interesting. And quite remarkably, you know, in history, after that, you know, the heyday in, in, in ancient history, we've lost exercise entirely until this famous uh, physician uh, in the Renaissance, um, uh, Girolamo Mercuriale, um, who was a physician in, in Italy, uh, brought back exercise to the fore, um, which had been lost for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and he, he went back to the original classics. And since then, exercise has made a comeback. Um, and he, in his book, again, from the 16th century, defines exercise as, well, you can read probably faster than I can read it out. But the key is a change in breathing pattern. You need to pant. And if you don't pant, he doesn't equate this with exercise, which I thought was interesting. And we may come to that uh, in a minute. Um, yeah, so what are good reasons uh, uh, to, exercise, uh, to exercise? And you can click four times, David. Um, one reason is, of course, there are generic benefits. Um, you, you don't just have Parkinson's. Exercise has good effects on bone health and cardiac health and pulmonary health. There is now at least class two evidence that exercise works like a drug in suppressing the symptoms. I will point out that there is quite encouraging evidence that maybe, maybe aerobic exercise might be, might be the first disease modifying treatment. And I will conclude by some exciting work in my own group where we try to study exercise as a way to prevent Parkinson's. So, and I will walk you through um, some of the latest insights. And if you talk about working mechanisms, um, exercise still is largely a black box. We know what goes in, you know, 30 minutes of aerobic exercise. We know what comes out, better health. But how this is mediated is still largely unknown. But I will just give you a very exciting recent finding, which I thought was really encouraging. And it's a paper that was published. Um, so these are all papers published in, in high-end journals where they speculate about the benefits of exercise and how it might work. Lots of speculation. Um, it's sort of summarized in this cartoon. So people speculate about neural growth factors, changes in the immune system, um, enhanced strength of circuitries in the brain, ultimately leading to, you know, what we see on the outside, which is better behavior. But a lot of it is still speculation. And I came across this really interesting study. And I really, you know, it's so cool that you should fasten your seatbelt, um, which came out in science. And it's a paper where they had animals with an Alzheimer mutation either exercise all day on the right top or lead a sedentary behavior. And what they then did is after a period of exercise or leading a sedentary behavior, they transferred the plasma of both groups into a third recipient group that had also led a sedentary behavior. And lo and behold, it's just incredible, they were able to transfer the health benefits of the exercise group through a blood transfusion to the recipient animals. And moreover, they were able, from a blood analysis, able to distill the likely mediator, which is clusterin. And clusterin is an anti-inflammatory protein. So maybe one of the many ways through which exercise might exert its effects is through anti-inflammatory effects, which could explain part of the effects in Parkinson's disease, where we now know that inflammation is probably one of the many pathways that lead to neurodegeneration. May also explain why it's good for brain health in general, and also perhaps for people with Alzheimer's, where again, inflammation might play a role. 
Now, of course, this is not to say that our patients should now wait for a blood transfusion of a friend who's done the work. Um, but I think we should encourage our patients to exercise. And I strongly feel that if there is a good rationale behind the treatment, um, it encourages people to actually regularly engage in exercise. So I spend a lot of time in my clinic, not only telling people that they should exercise, but I take them on a course why they should exercise, including studies such as these. And in my experience, this promotes compliance. So I think a take home message is that we have a reasonable understanding of why exercise might benefit people with Parkinson's. Um, what about the efficacy? I think that it's encouraging that there are now a great number of studies that have shown the efficacy of exercise. It starts with anecdotal evidence of N of one, you know, observations. Nicolas Koukoulakis is um, a former European champion in weightlifting who friended me on Facebook um, and who shared a brilliant video with me. And click on the next slide, David, and we'll see the video. Um, you'll see this Mr. Koukoulakis, um, who now has Parkinson's disease. And ah, There he is. So he, he was freezing in the beginning, um, but he can climb stairs. He can ride a bicycle. But the moment he dismounts, he's frozen and stuck to the floor. But the reason for sharing this video is he's still an avid exerciser. And even though he can barely walk in daily life, as you've seen before, after a period of exercise, he can walk and he's much better. And look at the end of the video, which is brilliant. Ta-da! Really happy. So, of course, this is N of 1, but there is now evidence from many, many studies to support the merits. This is a meta-analysis, um, and you can click one more time. The major outcome here is VO2 max, in other words, fitness. And if you look at the um, diamond at the bottom, you can see that if you sum up the various studies in the field, there's a beneficial effect on fitness. Um, the meta-analysis also looked at symptomatic effects, um, and you can click uh, once, uh, David. Um, you see that for the UPDRS in the on state, when the medication is working well, there's a tendency towards a beneficial effect, but it's not statistically significant. Again, focus on the black diamond. If you look at the off state, uh, you'll see that there is a statistically significant benefit uh, in the off state, which is when people need the exercise most. Um, so that's encouraging, born from a meta-analysis. And this was a really interesting study where they looked at mortality as a very robust and rigorous outcome. It's uh, work done by Michael Schwarzschild and Alberto Ashirio from Boston. Um, so uh, you could say this is a home paper um, where they looked at mortality as a rigorous outcome measure. And they looked at both diet and physical activity. And the take home message of their paper was that there was a lower mortality associated with greater volumes of physical activity uh, both the volume of activities, but also the number of hours in moderate intensity activities. But, but there was also a benefit of a healthier diet, which in their study was mainly uh, the Mediterranean diet. Uh, and the benefits were seen for people who had exercised or eaten healthier, both prior to the diagnosis and also when they continued that behavior after the diagnosis. And quite interestingly, there was no interaction effect. In other words, the beneficial effects of exercise and uh, uh, a good diet appeared to be largely independent. And that was fascinating to my mind. Um, so here's again, you can read this quicker than I can read it out. Uh, it appears that exercise reduces mortality. Uh, it, it's helpful prior and after the diagnosis. And maybe, maybe it's early days, of course. Diet is still early days. You can combine it with a healthier diet. This brought me back to the you know, the ancient Greek times when the famous legendary Hippocrates already said that food and exercise, while possessing opposite qualities, work together to produce health. Isn't that fascinating? All comes from the book Sweat by Bill Hayes, who, by the way, was Oliver Sacks' husband. And um, that's how I got to know him through Oliver Sacks. So which components of exercise? Well, that's the question I get asked most often in, in, in my clinical practice. Next slide. Um, 
it's most important that it's personalized, that people like what they're doing. And whether this is boxing, for which there is now a lot of good evidence, or uh, table tennis, uh, ping pong, um, or cycling, um, and you can click again, David, it really doesn't matter what you do, as long as you do it. This man has got Parkinson's disease, he can barely walk, but he can run marathons. And it's a lovely video because you can see he doesn't swing his arm as well as he should. So you can actually see his Parkinson's during running. Um, but it really doesn't matter what you and this is dancing, by the way. Beautiful video from the Netherlands, where all these patients are mimicking an exaggerated stooped posture, even people dancing in their wheelchair. And this young girl opens up these people like flowers. Really beautiful. Uh, there's now a number of studies that have shown that dancing is also a, an effective way of improving quality of life. And in this paper we published in JAMA Neurology, uh, we discussed, you know, which components really drive the exercise benefits in Parkinson's. And there are probably at least two components. One component is the aerobic component, sweat. You know, remember the book Sweat? Uh, and again, the Greeks already recognized it's the sweat component that's critical. Um, so this is one of the few studies where they've looked at the intensity of exercise. This is again work from the United States, uh, Daniel Korkos uh, and his group. Um, this is one of the seminal papers in the field of exercise. And what they cleverly did is they compared two doses of exercise and a third group that was no exercise. High intensity, a higher heart rate, 80% of your maximum heart rate, or 60 to 65% of maximum heart rate. And you can see that the target heart rate zone was adequately reached in both intervention groups. They did a fine job in achieving their target heart rate. And in the next slide, you'll see that the usual care group, so the y-axis shows the change in UPDRS score. So a zero means no change. And you can see on the far right that the box plot is above zero for usual care, which makes sense because they've progressed over the six months during the study, which is what you would expect in a progressive condition. Progression is slightly less for low intensity, but it is considerably less, and this was statistically significant, for the high intensity group. So this is the first, definitely the best, and one of very few studies that have looked at the dose of exercise and convincingly shown that the higher the dose, the higher the heart rate, the better the effect. Um, so the dose of exercise matters. Next slide. Now, what is really interesting is that, again, going back to the ancient Greek philosophers, Plato himself, said it's not just the number of exercises, but their moderate nature. So Plato was speculating, and of course he never did a randomized clinical trial, that moderate exercise would also be good. And there is now evidence to support Plato's assumption. Um, this study looked at, again, mortality in Parkinson's as a very robust outcome measure. And they looked at the intensity of exercise in relation to that particular outcome. Next slide. And what you can see is that there is a benefit for people with vigorous exercise, figure A, moderate exercise, figure B, but also for people with light physical activity levels in figure C. And even though, although the effect is smaller for light physical activity, there is a benefit on mortality. So if you have patients in your clinic who are too disabled to engage in vigorous exercise, you can tell them that simply increasing the volume of activities at a leisure pace will also give them a benefit. Next slide. Um, and this was Thomas Jefferson, your famous past, past, past president, who said that no less than two hours a day should be devoted to exercise. And this is brilliant. And the weather shall be little regarded. If the body is feeble, the mind will not be strong. Thomas Jefferson, hero. All comes from the book Sweat, by the way. So the drivers of exercise benefits is the intensity, the work by Daniel Korkos, 
but also uh, the volume of activities. And there are a number of studies, I've shown only one in the interest of time, that confirm that volume of activities, even at a leisure pace, uh, is also a driver of exercise benefits. Now, these are Dutch snacks. And my main disclosure probably is I, I'm fond of these things and they're terribly unhealthy. If ever you're my guest in the Netherlands, the first thing we'll do is order these snacks. And why am I showing you this? Very interesting new work from California by Giselle Petzinger is showing that 30 minutes of exercise is good, but the benefits are equal if you do one block of 30 minutes versus 30 times one minute. And that is really helpful in clinical practice because you can tell your patients, climb the stairs instead of taking the lift or the elevator. Take your bicycle instead of your car to do the shopping. And each minute of exercise sums up to reach your 30 minute workout per day. And uh, this had already been seen in the field uh, of cardiology uh, and cardiometabolic health, but there is now also evidence in the field of Parkinson's disease. So exercise snacks and, and just the word exercise snacks has such a positive connotation that I use it a lot in clinical practice. And I can tell you patients love it and it promotes compliance. So exercise snacks may be helpful. Next slide. Now, this is a, a very interesting study we published uh, in the Lancet. What we basically did is we also looked at uh, the type of exercise. And what we compared is treadmill walking, aerobic exercise, to the same amount of treadmill walking. But now when people were submerged in a complex three-dimensional virtual reality world, arguing that combining aerobic exercise with a cognitively challenging environment would afford greater benefit. Um, our primary outcome was false. And you can see false here on the y-axis. And you can see that both groups benefit. In other words, both groups sustained fewer falls after the intervention, which makes sense because we have an active control. Treadmill training is not placebo. Treadmill training is an effective intervention. But the effect was greater for treadmill training plus virtual reality. Um, now the counter argument I often get, and that's well taken is, the best way of receiving that multimodal stimulation is to just exercise outdoors and not in a silly gym, you know, with a, but anyways, it demonstrates that multimodal interventions, I think that's in the next slide as a conclusion, multimodal interventions are probably better than aerobic exercise alone. You can achieve it in the gym, uh, but you can probably as easily achieve it by exercising outdoors. Next slide. Um, it was also a deeply frustrating study. My PhD student nearly went into a depression. And the reason is that we had great difficulty recruiting people into the study, which was a fully hospital-based intervention because we required this expensive complex treadmill and a complex virtual reality environment. And people were just not keen to go to the hospital two to three times a week. So that motivated us to really look at barriers and motivators for exercise. Compliance with exercise, you know, is a major issue. And apparently, you know, having to travel long distances to a place where you need to do the exercise is a barrier. Uh, we published a paper uh, oh, and this is just a cartoon to illustrate. I, I, I really love this cartoon that people, you know, prefer toxic pills and surgery, the quick fix, if you will, uh, over a lifestyle change, which requires, of course, you know, you doing the job instead of passively leaning backward and letting the pill or the surgeon do the job. So we published a paper where we uh, looked at, um, uh, oh, and again, going back to history, uh, this is the Mercuriale himself. Uh, and he admits, you know, exercise can be hard and it can be unpleasant. Uh, but, and I think this is beautifully said, 16th century, mind you, 16th century, good health is not incompatible with some discomfort. Um, so this is the paper that we published where we looked at barriers and motivators to engage in exercise. Next slide. And it's actually nice to see at the main 
barriers and you can click three times, David. Um, one is you don't feel immediate benefits. In fact, most people with Parkinson's feel very tired after the exercise, thinking they've made matters worse. So you need to tell your patients, an exercise consumes all dopamine in your brain. You'll probably feel lousy after the exercise, but that is actually a driver of brain plasticity. We'll come to that in a minute. Um, I tell my patients to take extra levodopa prior to their workout, which is an effective way of fighting that excessive fatigue after exercise. People complain of lack of time. There you can squeeze in your exercise snack story. And of course, fear of falling, which is a realistic fear because Parkinson's is the world's number one falling disease. But for example, cycling on a stationary bicycle is safe from a falling perspective. So there are ways to exercise without the risk of falling. Um, what we did in a study that we published ourselves in the British Medical Journal is to see whether a coach would be helpful. Um, this is, I believe, the head coach uh, for the Boston Celtics. And I think if a sportsman needs a coach, a patient with Parkinson's definitely needs a coach. Uh, and this is what we studied in the British Medical Journal. We allocated patients to different programs. One was to move safer, supervised by a coach. The other one was to move more intensely, also supervised by a coach. So park safe versus park fit. Uh, we showed benefits of exercise, but I'm actually showing you this study for another reason, which is the, um, uh, the recruitment. Uh, you can click one more time. Um, people uh, who did not want to participate, look at the bottom row, were the ones that were least active spontaneously. So the people that needed exercise most were the ones that were least motivated to engage in exercise. Isn't that interesting? Uh, which means that our trials are biased. Uh, I often have marathon runners who ask me if they can participate in a trial on exercise. And of course, they don't need to study. Uh, you want those you know, inactive people in your studies, but we have difficulty finding them. Um, and probably to conclude, um, this is probably my best cited study in the field of exercise. It's been well cited overall. It's a paper published in Lancet Neurology, where we looked at home-based exercise, realizing that asking people to come to the clinic or come to a gym um, is a barrier for them. It was completely remotely supervised. And basically, we... Um, what we did is we put a stationary bicycle in the patient's homes. So we addressed the fear of falling. That's one, because you can't fall off the bicycle. We addressed the issue of traveling to clinics because it was a home-based intervention. And we gamified the entire intervention, knowing that you have to make the exercise palatable to patients. Um, this is a brilliant, on one of my trips to the United States, I came across this fitness room. You know, the Americans go to the fitness room, but they take the escalator instead of climbing the stairs. So just to demonstrate how difficult it is to adhere to exercise anyway, what we did is we did all sorts of gamification elements. And we had an app on the tablet that motivated people to start the exercise and we gave them anticipated rewards if they were able to exercise, if they were planning to do so. We gamified the exercise itself. For example, people were doing the good old Pac-Man game, you know, the 80s game. Um, and at the end of the exercise, they had killed 10 monsters by moving more. But in effect, they had exercised for 30 to 40 minutes at 80% cardiac output, which is what we wanted them to do. Uh, and then after the exercise, um, they unwrapped their gift. So, for example, uh, they were sitting on the couch. The app said, if you're exercising now, um, my husband um, uh, will mow the lawn for you or will wash the dishes or, you know, whatever. And then you've done your exercise. And then the husband says, I'm done mowing the, uh, the lawn. Um, I'll, I'll work on the dishes next. And it worked brilliantly. Um, we... Um, um, we had a randomized clinical trial 
where everything was identical, including all the gamification elements, but the exercise group was on the stationary bike three times a week. The control group merely did stretching exercises, but they were also motivated by a coach and all the gamification elements in the exact same way. And after debriefing the participants in the trial, they both felt they had received the real deal. And you can click one more time, David. In the left column, you see the training goals, and you can see in the right column what was actually achieved. And lo and behold, thanks to the gamification elements, people did even more than what we had asked them to do. So compliance, despite all the difficulties of having Parkinson's disease, was excellent in this study. Next slide. So what about the results? Um, this was our primary outcome measure. And this looks just like Daniel Corcus' study. Again, you'll see the Delta UPDRS motor score on the y-axis, a zero line meaning no difference. You can see that the control group doing stretching worsened, just as in Daniel's study, whereas the intervention group improved a bit. Uh, and this was statistically significant. And more importantly, a difference of four points on the UPDRS is also deemed clinically relevant. It's not a huge effect, but this is a six month intervention. And I think it's a clinically relevant effect. So there are now two studies, Daniel Corcus's paper and our paper that show that if you do nothing, you decline. And with exercise, whether this be treadmill walking as in Daniel's study or cycling as in our study, your symptoms stabilize over time. Now that could be interpreted as a disease modifying effect. You know, as well as I do, how horribly difficult it is to prove disease modification. But what is really interesting, and these are new data, in our study, we also did functional MRI and structural MRI before and after exercise. That was published in a separate paper that came out in Annals of Neurology just recently. And this paper, again, has been cited a lot. And the key result is that we stopped atrophy from taking place. So in the stretching group, over the course of six months, there was a bit of atrophy happening, and we saw less atrophy in the exercise group. But more importantly, we also showed that there was enhanced functional connectivity between the diseased basal ganglia and the healthy brain's cortex probably taking over functions of the diseased basal ganglia. So exercise as a driver of brain plasticity, which I think is incredible. And in my clinic, I use this study to tell my patients, if you're on the treadmill, if you're on your stationary bicycle and you don't feel like exercising, think about these new functional connect connections. And it's hugely motivating and encouraging for patients. So I'm cautious as a scientist. I think this is not enough to say we now have a proven disease modifying intervention, but it's definitely encouraging that the symptoms stabilize and that we're seeing brain plasticity, which had been seen before in animals, but this is the very first time it's been shown uh, in human beings. All right, thank you very much. Really, really uh, exciting data and uh, motivates me. I, I know what I'll be doing this afternoon. Um, so really, um, thank you very practice much. Practice what you preach, yeah? Yes, yes. So uh, we do have a few questions here and people should feel free to add them to the chat, although we may not have time to get to them all. I, I, and I apologize to our audience because we are a bit over time, but that's not from your fault. It's due to uh, uh, our earlier video that took a little longer. Um, See, one person asks, how can I find more about the exercise and DBS trial shown in the clinical trial slide? Sorry, say, say it again, how? They're asking about, I guess, on your clinical trial slide, there was a slide yeah. about uh, an exercise trial and people who've had DBS. And maybe it ah. just, and he's asking, how can I find out more, but maybe in general, how to find out more about clinical trials? Yeah. Right. So... I don't think anybody has looked at exercise specifically for post-DBS patients. 
um, I, I, they were part of our study, so it was not an exclusion criterion in any of the studies that I mentioned. So they're part of the overall repertoire, and I don't think exercise or DBS is a contraindication. Um, I think they should exercise as much as anybody else. Okay. Uh, what? Uh, here's another one. Does BDNF increase with aerobic exercise in people with Parkinson's? Um, uh, a number of people have looked, including ourselves, uh, uh, and yes, uh, neural growth factors in plasma go up. Uh, the question is whether plasma is an adequate reflection of the brain's changes. Um, so you would ideally do uh, lumbar punctures, but we, there are studies that have linked changes in growth factors in blood, but also the people with polymorphisms um, that were more likely to generate growth factors were also the ones who responded better uh, to exercise. So uh, I think growth factors are an important mediator of the uh, uh, effects of exercise, yes. And maybe just for the time, we'll do just one more question, and my apologies that we won't get to all the questions. When one person asks about the minimum, uh, is it five hours minimum weekly or just three times 45 minutes weekly? Yeah. No, that's an excellent question. The um, uh, the WHO criteria is three times a week, 30 minutes. I can tell you what I tell my patients. I tell them exercise 30 minutes every day. And why every day? If you, if you have to exercise three times a week, there's always tomorrow. If you have to exercise every day, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. Build it into your regime. Build it into your daily routine. And do two things. A, exercise in an aerobic fashion for 30 minutes every day, no matter what you do, as long as you like it and you do it. And enhance the volume of your activities by simply taking longer walks, 10,000 steps at a leisure pace is better than 5,000 steps at a leisure pace. And I find that to be very helpful. I mentioned the snacks, which people find very helpful. And that's the dose that I recommend. Uh, one quick question is, can people overdose? We don't know. But there are two or three anecdotes of people who started to run a marathon every day with Parkinson's and who worsened and actually never got back to their old levels. Perhaps they had mitochondrial dysfunction. So yes, I think there is a remote possibility of overdosing. Uh, and you know, on dopamine agonists, people can become addicted to sex, drugs, shopping, but I have seen people becoming addicted to exercise. So it is something to be aware of. It's rare, but it happens. Great. Well, thank you again. Wonderful, wonderful talk, wonderful presentation. I'm sure we could go on, but I greatly appreciate your, your joining us today. And uh, like you say, it's nice with, uh, with uh, the Zoom option that you could do this all the way from the Netherlands.